Hi there, and let me welcome you back to chapter 14 of our DB2 course. We are discussing query optimization currently. All right, so, uh, well, the last video discussed the uh, dynamic programming algorithm that uh, was exploring the join search space, which can be enormous, even for moderately complex queries. Well, while we discussed that, we were always talking about a uh, plan cost, identify the cheapest plan, identify the best plan, invoke the prune function to identify the most promising, the cheapest plan among a set of given plans and so on. So, well, these plan cost, the estimated plan cost are actually uh, uh, super relevant in query optimization. So, uh, well, of course, we don't have the have the option to uh, really evaluate and execute all of these uh, generated plans to assess their true cost. What we only can do is to assign an abstract cost measure that we hope models the reality close enough so that we can base our, our decisions on these uh, on these cost estimates and. Uh, uh, exactly this this plan cost estimation that will be the topic of the final three videos i think of this entire db2 course once we are uh, through with our discussion of uh, plan cost estimation i think then we call it the day for this particular semester all right so uh, all right so i hear the industrial lawn mowing again let me close the window i'm sorry about that Arr. Alrighty, I'm sorry about that. It's much better now. Right. So, uh, well, um, what uh, what RDBMS is typically try to do? They uh, they will develop such a cost measure. Uh, I'm sorry, a cost measure that will try to model the total execution time of a plan. So the total execution time has been the time that we have to wait until the last row is finally delivered by the execution of this particular plan okay so uh, well if you if you recall the explain output that is being generated by postgresql then uh, in the explain you would find this cost range annotation at the uh, individual operators there were two cost mirrors uh, output there we are looking at the total cost which would be the second in this range the c2 value here well, the first one has been the startup cost or the query delay cost that we, the, the time we have to wait until the first tuple arrives. But what we try to optimize for here is the total execution time. So the total cost of the plan would be C2 when we have really produced the final row of the query and we can, uh, we can uh, consider the plan done. All right. So what we will uh, uh, discuss now in the in the upcoming videos will be a cost model, an abstract model of the true cost that the system faces when it evaluates a plan. It, we won't be able to assess the true cost maybe measured in milliseconds or whatever. There is just too many system configuration parameters, just so many influences on plan evaluation and the plan evaluation time that it will be hopeless and probably also useless to precisely model plan execution time well in terms of milliseconds nanoseconds or what have you we will do with a abstract cost model that measures plan cost in some well abstract currency let's say abstract value in some abstract measure and uh, well to uh, to really make sure that uh, none of you think about the plan cost in terms of whatever milliseconds for example let's assign that silly unit name to plan cost space dollar all right so what the system measures and tries to derive is the space dollar cost for uh, for a given plan as opposed to the true cost which would be probably measured in milliseconds or some measure of cpu time or an count of io operations or something all of this will not 
be done. We will assign an abstract cost measure to the plans that we will use to identify the best plan among two given plans. So what we hope will hold is if we assign or evaluate our abstract cost model over one particular plan P1 and then another plan P2, well, then the space dollar cost for both of these plans will be will compare in some way. Let's say P1 is uh, the cheaper plan in terms of cost uh, of space dollar. Then uh, if that cost model really is worth its value, if it's a good cost, good cost model, well, then the true cost, which we probably never know, only know once we have executed P1, the true cost of P1 will then also be less than the true cost of P2. As long as this relationship exists, we can use space dollars, the estimated cost that we can assess, to uh, inform our query optimizer. Uh, please select, select plan P1. It will probably be the cheaper plan according to our cost model, an abstract model of the reality. All right. So just to remind you how these cost annotations are to be found in the explain outputs. Well, explain shows these cost annotations in a range, as I've just told you. Uh, well, the range starts with the startup cost, the time we have to wait until the first row arrives, and it ends with the total cost, the time we have to wait until the last row has been produced. And this is the cost we try to look at when we uh, make the decisions for the best plan. Total cost wins here in this particular case. And again, this is in the unit of space dollar, not in the unit of uh, milliseconds or whatever. Please don't confuse this with the output of X plane analyze, which will, in addition to these cost measures, cost estimates, will also list the actual times needed to produce the first and the last rows. Of course, these are measured in well in time units in in real milliseconds not so for the estimated cost that you will see when we simply invoke explain without analyze what you will also see is an estimate of the size of the overall result produced by this particular operator in this example it's just an hash join okay so uh, well the system estimates that the hash join will uh, return among about 505,000 rows in this particular case. And it also estimates, although that estimate tends to be uh, rather precise because it's uh, based on the static knowledge about the width of the participating rows, it also estimates that all of these rows will have an average width of 50 bytes. All right, so all of these are estimates. Well, estimates computed based on metadata that the system has available when the plan is being produced and compiled, not when the plan is being executed. All right, so uh, what we see as annotations here is these total cost and startup uh, cost values. From these, we can easily uh, derive the run cost, the actual time that the system has, no, the actual cost that the system assigns to the evaluation of this particular hash join here. Okay, so uh, well, it's just the difference between the total cost and the startup cost. It's typically not shown in explain output, but we can easily derive this abstract run cost measure. Okay, uh, actually, it, it's, it's quite interesting when we uh, were using the set enable bitmap scan, set enable sequential scan equals to on or off. In particular, if we use the off option here, then actually what PostgreSQL internally does it assigns a ridiculously high startup cost to one particular operator. Say if we set enable hash join to off here, then that would internally lead the system to assign uh, the ridiculously high startup cost of 10 to the power of 10 to the uh, hash join here. Well, together with the real with the estimated run cost of the hash join, this ridiculous startup cost plus the run cost leads to ridiculous total cost, which will lead the system to probably ignore hash join at this particular uh, time. It will be just super expensive in terms of space dollar units so that it won't be considered for the generation of plants. Well, if there is really no other option, if there is just no other option, 
then to use this particular operator that we've just disabled with enable operator equals to off. Well, then even a cost of 10 to the power of 10 would be acceptable. If there is no other option, well, then that operator would be picked. So this is how these set enable options are uh, implemented in terms of these abstract space dollar costs. I find that quite interesting. It's a nice trick. To convince you that these costs that we see here are really some abstract cost measure and that they do not reflect reflect real evaluation times let's quickly switch over to the terminal here all right here we are again with our postgresql terminal and uh, what you see is that i've switched back to the scratch database for now so we've left the tpch database sample database and we are connected again to the uh, scratch database that we have used so often in our playground experiments uh, what you see here that we are uh, working over the well-known ternary table here. All right, so I've already uh, recreated the ternary table in the Scratch database uh, for you. And what I will do now, I will, uh, well, I will evaluate two queries. I will evaluate two queries, uh, a very simple sequential scan query over the ternary table. And as you can see in the select clause, I'm evaluating this particular uh, arithmetic expression. It's just the TA value, the A column value in the ternary table plus one. All right. Well, we will talk about this uh, cast here in a second. So that would be one query. And the other query would be almost the same. It's a sequential scan over the ternary table T. But in this case, I'm uh, outputting the factorial of the A column value. As you can imagine, computing the factorial well, will stress the CPU and the system during query evaluation uh, quite a bit more than this simple evaluation of uh, other, uh, of an addition uh, of the literal one. Uh, I've introduced this cast here or out of fairness reasons, so to say. This factorial will lead uh, to the computation, computation of a big in value, so rather a wide in value uh, uh, represented with uh, eight bytes internally and just for fairness reasons that we are talking about the same width of integers here in our ar arithmetic expressions I'm casting the a value here to big int all right so uh, these are really two very comparable queries uh, simple sequential scan evaluation of a select clause and as you can see I've attached the explain verbose analyze here so I will have uh, the system estimate the cost of the evaluation of these two queries and then indeed perform the two queries to see the actual evaluation times that we, uh, that we measured, that we saw when these queries were evaluated. Okay, so uh, let's see what we can find here. Uh, first thing first. All right, so that went quick, I would say. Uh, the, the plan is as simple as we were uh, anticipating it. It's just a simple sequential scan. All right. And uh, well, the cost of this particular plan, the cost of this particular plan were estimated to be 25 space dollars. 25 space dollars. The startup cost indeed is zero space dollars because we can immediately um, start to produce output rows here. There is no, no delay, no um, response time that we have to wait uh, uh, its uh, immediate production of uh, first results in 25 space dollar time or cost we can uh, evaluate this uh, entire sequential scan and it's the same estimate for the second query where we are uh, pro uh, uh, computing the factorial i think you have already seen that the duration of that time of that query took uh, some longer time so i see something like 3.4 seconds here and we saw well 4.1 milliseconds in the first query case uh, the interesting thing is that also for the factorial query the cost estimate the space dollar estimate of the system for this particular query is identical to the first query now, in very abstract terms, this is the very same query. We are mainly interested in the I.O. operations, which tables are to be scanned, how will they be scanned, well, using a sequential scan. Well, then 
the rows are being passed to expression evaluation, but as you can see, it appears that the abstract cost model uh, largely abstracts from the actual evaluation cost of these expressions. The system is just not informed about the fact that the computation of the factorial takes considerably longer than the evaluation of this simple addition. This fact is simply not reflected in our cost model. All right, uh, well, the system, of course, indeed measured wildly different execution times when it uh, evaluated these uh, these queries, as you can see here and, uh, and uh, here, for example. Uh, but, uh, well, this is not reflected in the abstract cost model. Still, it will be a useful cost model that helps us to decide between cheap and, well, not the so cheap expensive plans. All right, so space dollars are no milliseconds. Uh, the uh, like so so many aspects of PostgreSQL. Uh, also, the PostgreSQL cost model is highly configurable and of course uh, tweakable. So what you will find in your configuration files for the PostgreSQL server are basic parameters, basic cost model parameters that uh, try to reflect the uh, the true evaluation cost in a typical system setup. If your system setup deviates from this typical default setup, well, then it would be your task to modify these particular cost model parameters in the config file. Okay, so what would we find there? We would, uh, for example, find that the uh, sequential page access cost. So reading one page from secondary memory and then reading an adjacent, physically adjacent page from physical memory, which, which would be the good case, no seek costs, for example. These would be assigned this, the uh, a space dollar cost of one. Actually, this is the unit of, of, uh, of space dollars here. It's one sequential page access cost. All right, so that's one space dollar that we have to expend to read the next page in a sequential I.O. scan. All right, well, it's different for random page accessors, which are four times as expensive. Well, uh, as you know, random page accessors uh, incur uh, disk seeks and uh, they incur uh, uh, waiting times, especially for devices that are uh, based on hard disk drive, so it makes sense to assign a higher random page cost here. We will not benefit from uh, caching effects as we do from sequential page cost or from prefetching, uh, so there will be a higher cost. And well, this is the the, uh, the current configuration, the default configuration of PostgreSQL that uh, says, well, such a random page cost is four times as expensive as sequential page cost. This is, of course, a wild simplification. As you know, well, there can be random page accessors between two pages that can be considerably sim uh, more uh, cheap because there is, uh, well, probably less head movement involved or something. But uh, these could also be considerably more expensive. Assigning such a simple four space dollar cost here to this operation uh, really reflects that we are doing abstraction here, simplification to cut down the complexity of assessing the real cost that we would uh, um, encounter in the evaluation of the plants. Well, then there is other uh, uh, cost like uh, CPU tuple cost, which would uh, model the cost that this that we uh, that we have to expand if the CPU is to process a heap file row. A heap file row has to be read from its page. It has to be decoded. We have to identify the different fields. You remember our discussion when we uh, discussed the navigation inside uh, one row. Well, this CPU tuple cost is meant to uh, to reflect that. It would be one hundredth of the cost of a sequential page cost in this abstract cost model. All right. There's also CPU index tuple cost. Well, we of course, uh, if we are reading the leaf pages of an index, uh, then there is uh, uh, some work to be done to um, well to scan the index page to 
read an index entry to decode that index entry uh, to uh, separate that index entry into its key value and the read the page pointer that it uh, that it possesses all of this is being extracted away into the cpu index tupper cost their cpu operator cost which uh, models the cost of the invocation of a uh, say an arithmetic operator or um uh, the invocation of the function, all right? And as you can see, there's just one CPU operator cost of 0 0.0025 here. We do not, we do not uh, uh, have separate CPU operator costs for the factorial function and the addition function, for example. All of these uh, are handled the same in this abstract cost model. And then there is uh, other other cost model uh, parameters that are more concerned with the parallel evaluation of plans. Uh, you see that there is some cost involved in passing a row from the worker uh, that is represented by the gather nodes in the parallel plans to uh, to some leader. And there is also uh, the parallel setup cost which would be the super high cost to spawn a parallel worker, which would be a separate process in the architecture of PostgreSQL. All right, so that is really, it's thousand times as expensive as doing a simple sequential page cost. So spawning a new Unix process, setting up all the uh, communication channels between processes, this is super expensive. So, uh, well, it really has to be worthwhile to spawn such a parallel worker if these costs are to be uh, um, justified. All right, so of course these parameters are tweakable, as I told you. Um, um, uh, well, we uh, suffer from C costs, so normally we would have the random page cost to be much larger than the sequential page cost. But, well, if your database fits into RAM entirely, then there will probably be uh, no penalty regarding random page cost. Uh, uh, also, the random page cost may be less, uh, um, maybe less if we are operating in an environment where we are working with SSDs. So you can see uh, tweaking this cost model well can lead to a more accurate modeling of the true CPU hardware architecture and application scenario that you will have in your in your concrete database system. All right. So now that this idea of an abstract cost model has been set up and we have looked at the parameters of the cost model itself, uh, we'll, we will spend the next two videos on, uh, on in the investigation of how PostgreSQL internally models the cost of, uh, say, a sequential scan, right? So uh, there is quite a few bits and pieces of, of, of details that have to be modeled there to properly assess the cost of a sequential in, uh, scan, and we will do that in the upcoming video. And the video after that, we will model the cost of an index scan, which even has more parts that are being involved, like the heap file and uh, the B plus tree index that is involved. And while the heap file may be clustered or maybe non-clustered, all of this is being baked into the, uh, the cost model. So it's not abstracting away from all of the uh, of the uh, ex uh, expected costs, but some some aspects of the system are being abstracted away. All right, so uh, uh, I hope you will stay around for these last two videos just to round things off here. I'm looking forward to discuss this stuff with you and uh, see you in a few minutes or whenever you will like to watch these videos. Bye bye.